Hey everyone, I'm Brandon Frazen, Director of Vintage here at Bob's Watches, and I'm joined by our CEO and founder and friend, Paul Altieri, and we're gonna showcase one of his amazing vintage watches from his personal collection for our Vintage of the Week. Before we get into it, let's uh, do a quick wrist check. What are you wearing, Paul? Geez, Brandon, this old thing? <laughs> uh, this is a 1969-70 vintage Rolex Red Submariner. It's a uh, meters first. Nice. It's from my personal collection, so it's technically not for sale. <laughs> but we do have several on the site right now for sale. Yep. I think the 1680 Red is sort of a staple watch that you want to have in your collection if you're building a vintage. It's still somewhat affordable, although they have shot up in value For quite sure. a bit the last five years. Uh, but it's a great watch, it's fun to wear, it's wearable. This one happens to come uh, from the original owner. Hey, and so Brandon, what are you wearing today? Oh, I've got on a 1019 Milgauss from 1979. I kind of stuck with the red and black theme. You know, it's one of the most underrated vintage Rolexes, so I'm a big fan. Yeah. Well, I love the black dials always. Yeah, so. it's, it's great, striking. Great looking watch. All right, uh, enough about what we're wearing. What did you bring for us today, Paul? Well, I think I brought something uh, kind of special. To me, it is anyways. I've got hundreds of watches in my personal collection, but this is technically one of my grail pieces. Mm -hmm. It's a 6200 Submariner, uh, circa 1954. Yep. Uh, I call it the king of Rolexes. To me, it's sort of special, not only because it's super rare, uh, but, but because of the look. It's, it's a large watch. For back in that period they were sort of making watches that were uh, smaller in size yep. and then the other thing that's striking about it it has a, a no hash mark bezel which mm -hmm. sort of stands out and and sort of the cleanness of the dial there's no there's very little text on the dial and and it looks like something from you know hundreds of years ago it's got <laughs> that old old look to it and it's just a cool watch uh, when you wear it uh, people notice it and they want to know immediately what is what are you wearing what is on your wrist and so it's a really cool watch uh, I'm fortunate enough to have to have come by it and I bought it years ago at a, at, at a good price um, but back then I did pay a lot for it I paid fair market value because uh, I wanted one I didn't have mm -hmm. one in my collection uh, but I'm proud to have it it came from the original owner down in San Diego and this one right here is in sort of mint condition almost new old stock has hardly any wear on it at all. It's still got the original bevel, uh, bevels on the on the case, mm -hmm. uh, original crystal because it's got some crazing to it, which is always kind of cool. Uh, but it's all original. It's a nice, clean, honest uh, example, and it'll probably be in my collection forever. So I know you're dying to pick it up and take a look at it. So why don't you go ahead and inspect right. it? Tell me what Thank you think you. about it. Thank you. Wow, this thing is just stunning. You know, in my almost decade in the watch business. I've really only seen a few of these, and this is definitely one of the nicest. Um, it's estimated that only about, Rolex only made about 300 of these in the tight mm -hmm. serial number range, but who knows how many are actually left. So many have been destroyed, all serviced out, just lost over the years, because these were real tool watches, so I imagine there's some probably at the bottom of the ocean too. Um, but looking at this dial, it just what stands out is, that, like you mentioned before, Paul, you know, the lack of text, the 369 is just, this was the first Submariner to, to offer the 369 Explorer style dial. Rolex would later use it in the 5513, 5512, the other Big Crown 6538. Um, this is also the first Submariner to use the 8mm Big Crown, which helped give the watch you know, <coughs> twice as much water resistance than the previous models. So this had about 200 meters water resistance, where the earlier ones were just 100. And that's why this is kind of considered, at the time, it was a more serious tool watch. Um, and then, then, like you also said, Paul, the no-hash bezel is just pretty distinct on this model. And when looking closely, you can see this dial is kind of aging to a brownish color, which is just really stunning. Um, and another interesting thing about these older subs is the Mercedes hand is actually longer than the later model. So it's mm -hmm. kind of, it has a cool look. Yeah. Um, so we went over some of the details of the watch and the a little bit of the history. Uh, so Paul, I got to know, how did, how did you acquire this? You know, uh, we, we get hundreds of calls every, uh, every, every month from people all around the world, uh, mostly the U.S. 
this was unlike any of those calls, but uh, what made this different is it, it came to, uh, to fruition. And I say that because I probably had 100 calls over the years of people saying they have a, a 6200, mm -hmm. and 99% of the time it's, it's not a 6200. Right. But this one particular time, a, a guy had called in from San Diego, and he told one of the sales reps that he had a 6200 and he wanted to talk to Paul. And so I think her name was uh, Samantha at the time. And so Samantha comes walking in my office and said, uh, hey, Paul, I got a guy on the phone. He's from San Diego. He's thinking about selling his, uh, his grandfather's watch. And he's got an old 6200, he said, I think. And I said, really? OK, I'll take the call. And I took the call. And you know, the first thing I want to know is, does he really have a 6200? And so I talked to him, and after a couple of minutes, I started you know, thinking, wait, he might really have one. <laughs> wow. So he came up. We made an appointment uh, for a couple of weeks, and he drove up um, and put the watch in front of me you know, in my lobby. And I still remember it to this day, and I couldn't believe to have it in my hands. Mm -hmm. And the story is, is that it was his grandfather's watch given to him. His grandfather was a CB in the, in the uh, World War II. And his grandfather and the colonel did not get along, apparently, uh, for some reason. And so when the war was over and the war ended in 1945, 1946, uh, the colonel said to his secretary, hey, do me a favor, go to the Rolex store and buy a Rolex Samarina as a gift. I want to present it to my friend here, the CB. Uh, and so she did that, and she came back, and she picked out this particular watch. And they presented it to this grandfather of this guy from San Diego that brought it up. And he accepted the gift, kept it for about a week, maybe two weeks, and decided he didn't want to accept it. And he <laughs> said, uh, I don't care what he said. I know he wants to, quote, bury the hatchet, <laughs> but um, uh, why don't you give it? And so he gave it to his son and said, why don't you keep it? And his son said, well, I'm not going to keep it. I think it's, it's wrong. If you're not going to keep it and wear it, you should give it back to the <laughs> colonel. Well, the story goes is he said, well, let's, let's agree. Let's give it to your son, who happened to be nine years old at the time. And they put it in a safe deposit box. And that's where it's been all these years, for like 50 years until I bought it. So the story goes that I think his name was John. John drove up first time, showed it to me. We spent about two or three hours together. But he wasn't quite ready to sell it at the time. Mm -hmm. So he said, let me think about it. Let me go back. And if I decide to sell it, I'll call you. So two or three months later, I get a call from John. I had given him my cell phone number. He calls me and says, you know what? I decided to sell it. I'm going to come up. How about if I come up next week and Tuesday or Wednesday? I mm -hmm. forget what day it was. And he drove up. And I said, John, just for curiosity, what are you going to do with the money? And he said, I'm going to fund all three of my college kids' tuitions, nice. which I think was a good plan. And he, he really did feel sort of bad in a way that he was selling the watch, but it went for a good cause. And that's how I came to own the watch. And it was, it's been in my collection ever since. Wow. How many would you say come up at auction every year? One or two or? Yeah, I would say not yeah. many surface. And who yeah. knows how many are really even trading hands. But you just don't see them that often. And, off, and a lot of times you see them, but the bezel's kind of chewed up or the case right. is polished, uh, the dial is not, you know, this is just really nice. You know, these stories are really why I love the watch, you know, the watch world of being in this business. And I can't wait for you to share another one of your grail pieces with us and uh, we can go, you know, we can go over another one. Well, I'm happy to do it. You know, these watches are really cool in and of themselves, as you know. <laughs> but what's really nice is when they have a, a cool backstory to go along with them. And this one just happens to have you know, a really interesting backstory that I'm happy to share with everybody. Well, thanks everyone for joining us for this episode of Vintage of the Week. Um, we did it a little different this time, so tune in next week and uh, see what we have in store.